Welcome back. Well, Henry Ford would sure be proud. Ford is doing quite well these days, especially when you think of all the troubles at GM and Chrysler. Ford Canada just had its best August sales numbers in 20 years and could become the top-selling automaker in Canada this year. I'm joined by Dave Mondragon. He is the CEO of Ford Canada. Well, welcome. Thank you for having me. Now, you've worked in the U.S. and you've worked in Canada now for a couple of years. Take us through the Canadian market. I mean, all we seem to hear about in the U.S. is nobody's buying cars. Sales are flat, if not going down still. Right. But Canada's sales still seem to be going well. What's the difference in the markets? Yeah, well, first off, Canada didn't go through the peak and valley that the U.S. had. Our, in the auto industry, we went down 20 percent, peak the valley. Uh, and that really happened after the oil crisis back in 08. Mm -hmm. U.S. went down about 40 percent, peak the valley. So their ascent back will actually be more accelerated once the economy starts to pick back up. Uh, in Canada, we've had a more gradual approach. This year, we started off very strong. And, and I consider this year in our industry kind of in like a, a lion, out like a lamb. It's starting to soften up. The comps are getting more comparable year over year. Uh, in the fourth quarter, we think we'll just be up a few percentage points on a year-over-year -year basis. Now, what's the big issue facing uh, all car uh, sellers in Canada? Is it, is it still the, the incentives? Is it gas prices? What, what do you see as the big challenge going forward? Well, going forward, it's going to be fuel economy. And if you look at what we've done as a company, uh, we've put major R&D, our number one priority from our R&D investment standpoint uh, is best in class fuel economy. So we're bringing the vehicles to market today, like the Fiesta, like the all new Focus, mm -hmm. that get 50 miles to a gallon in Canada. The all new Explorer will get 30% uh, better fuel economy than the outgoing model. Uh, we'll get better, better fuel economy in our Explorer than most hybrids on the road. So, uh, you know, fuel economy is always going to be top and center with consumers, quality, safety, technology, Technology is a big deal right now for, for young consumers because they want to be able to use their iPods, use their phones, have a really adaptable environment in their car that really takes them and transcends them from home to their uh, transportation right. space back to another usable home space with their music and, and their videos. Now, there's been a big push, obviously, to electric, hybrid, that kind of thing. We've got the Chevy Volt coming out. We've got some other sort of yeah. modifications of that, the Prius as well. Where do you guys stand on that in terms of hybrids and eventually an electric car? Well, that's a great question. Uh, Ford Motor Company is the number one producer in North America of hybrids. Hmm. So we're number one. Uh, we're the number two producer globally. So we have a very strong position with regard to electric vehicles. We'll have five new electric vehicles in the market, electrified vehicles, by 2012. So we're very aggressive in this front. Now, that said, there's a difference between hybrid and pure electric. Right, right. Uh, and the difference we, being what? That one has, still runs on a bit of a gas. One still runs on gas and is, is charged. Our hybrid uh, technology, actually, as you break the vehicle, you start to recharge the batteries. Okay. And, and that's kind of how it works. On our, uh, on our Escape, you don't even kick in our new Focus. You don't even kick in the gas until you get over 45 kilometers. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, they're, they're very efficient, especially if you do a lot of city driving. The challenge, though, as we go forward, is really infrastructure for electric vehicles. There, there really is no infrastructure uh, throughout Canada or throughout the globe yet. We think that Asia will probably lead this. Uh, the U.S. is working very closely on that. But, but infrastructure is a challenge. You've got to have a place to charge them. You have to change consumer behavior. Consumers have to know when they come home with an electric vehicle, well, I've got to charge my vehicle. Mm -hmm. And I also have to know the range of distance that I'm going to travel the next day. So there's a lot of hurdles to overcome before we get to a to really a, a gas-free, let's say, environment for, tech, for a transportation. It's chicken and egg thing, though, right? Because, you know, people want these electric cars, but if there's no infrastructure, they're not going to buy them. And if they're not buying them, there won't be an infrastructure, yeah. right? Well, chicken and egg, and also there's a huge cost hurdle. You know, if you look at vehicles today, uh, the, average, the average cost that pay back uh, for the incremental cost of a hybrid today, based on today's prices and today's, today's fuel prices as well, is about seven years. For a pure electric vehicle, it's 10 to 15 years, depending on incentives. Mm -hmm. So fuel prices are low. Uh, incentives are still high, so transaction prices are, are fairly low as well. Uh, and what's going to happen is it's going to take time for, for those vehicles to really seat in the marketplace. How, how long, Price do, you are think have to how come long down. do you think it will take before we, we start really seriously driving electric cars? Pure electric cars? Yeah, yeah. Uh, at least a decade away. Mm -hmm. You know, I think we're going to see one, we're, we're forecasting between 1% and 2% uh, vehicle sales globally by 2020 to be pure electric. Mm. Hybrids, though, are very practical. Uh, fuel prices will go up in the next few years. We're forecasting fuel to be, oil, barrel oil to be well over $100 in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. Once that happens, segmentation shifts and people will look for fuel, fuel efficient vehicles. Hybrids will fall into that space. They're very affordable. That seven year payout on a hybrid will drop to two or three years and it'll be a very good alternative for a lot of so consumers. So, how big do you see that market? Uh, oh, we think that's going to blossom. Yeah. By the end of this decade, we think that traditional uh, combustion engines using, using gas are going to be about 75% of the global global mix. We think that hybrids, 
will be about 20 to 25 percent. Mm. In and North balance, America as well. In North America yeah. as well. Mm. Uh, and Canada as well. Oh. And we think that uh, after that, the, the balance will fall in for pure electric. Let's talk about incentives. You mentioned that. That has been the bane of the car companies for a long time now, whether mm. they be government incentives, which we've certainly yeah. seen an awful lot of lately, or yeah. just straight competition amongst the companies to provide more and more incentives. That, yeah. that seems to be slashing your own throats to some, to some extent. Yeah. Uh, is it coming down? Are you getting around that? What's, what's going on in the incentive? Yeah, it's a couple of things. First, that, that is uh, a mistake of days gone by, and we cannot allow our industry to get back into that, that uh, push-pull strategy, that binge and purge, strat purge strategy. Uh, it was truly detrimental to everything we did. Now, it was driven by fact that overcapacity has been a huge issue in our industry. Last year, capacity worldwide was 92 million units. So the industry could have built 92 million vehicles last year. Demand was around 60 million. So we're still running at very high levels of overcapacity at Ford. We closed 28 plants over the last few years. We let go 120,000 people. We've truly right-sized our business, so supply is in check with demand. Uh, we have no interest and no plan to ever go back to push-pull strategies. We will not overbuild build what the market really dictates. But you still have incentives, want. right? We have incentives, but they're nowhere near as aggressive. If you look at our net pricing, our net pricing in North America has improved about $3,000 over the last two years. So we've got a stronger net pricing position. Uh, we're truly delivering vehicles that have great value to consumers, but a lot of that is due to the fact that we've got global platforms. We've reduced our fixed operating costs immensely, and we're paying down our debt as a mm. company. It's about Ford. Is it, at one point, a few years ago, we had 97 nameplates globally. Mm -hmm. We've reduced that to 60 nameplates, and our plan is to go down to about 20 nameplates Why? globally. Why? Just because people can't handle so many brands or because it's yeah. easier to market them? Why, why the shift down? Greater economies of scale. Uh, our platforms, we used to have 25 platforms. We're going to go down to a dozen platforms worldwide. So we're sharing technology, and the, and the greatest thing you get from that is global efficiencies. Our C car, for example, our next class, world-class car, is the Focus that comes to market in the first quarter mm -hmm. of 2011 in Canada. That vehicle is 80% common throughout the world. In 22 markets that will sell that vehicle, 80% of the componentry mm -hmm. will be exactly the same. Think about the economies of that. We used to be a regional, a global company acting regionally. We'd make regional cars with no commonality. So we had no efficiencies. Now we take a vehicle that we used to make 200,000 and we're going to make a million and a half or two million of on the same platform with 80% commonality. Think about the efficiencies you can get mm -hmm. and the cost savings. We're going to be able to bring vehicles to market cheaper with higher level of technology, better quality, but more importantly for the company, we're going to be able to retain better margins on those vehicles. Let's talk about the industry in general. I mean, as you mentioned, you've been closing plants. GM certainly been closing plants. Mm -hmm. Thousands of workers have been laid off. Are we ever going to get back to where the North American, if you will, auto industry was a few years ago, or is this a permanent alteration and people just better live with the fact that these companies are going to be a lot smaller? Well, I mentioned overcapacity earlier. Overcapacity is still uh, probably the number one issue in the industry worldwide. We've got a lot of capacity in North America. We've got capacity in, uh, in Europe, overcapacity there. Uh, we don't have enough capacity in South America or over in Asia and China or, or Asia uh, and uh, India. So mm. those are where the opportunities. It's really blossoming there. Now, that said, uh, we think we have a great foundation here in North America right now. We've got good foot footing and we've got a great sustainable business. The opportunity really comes, though, to strengthen our, our uh, foundation once sales go up. We need North America. Ninety percent of what we make in Canada, we, we send over the border and we sell over in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and other markets in Mexico. So we need those markets to really take off to stabilize our, our foundation here. And, and i got to ask you this because, I mean, you guys didn't get government-owned. You didn't get the sort of government money that, that GM and Chrysler did. Uh, how, how do you react to that? I mean, the government had to play a role or said they had to play a role. Both Can Canadian and U.S. governments co-owned GM, uh, got into Chrysler as well. Uh, how does that make you guys? How, how do you compete with that, and how does that make you guys feel? Yeah, we, we feel very good about our position. Look, the only advantage to, go, to going bankruptcy at that time, uh, quite frankly, was to be able to write off a lot of debt. Uh, we've managed through some very difficult times on our own accord, uh, and we're doing it at our own pace. We've paid down in the last two years. We were at $44 billion of debt mm -hmm. a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. We're down to $27 billion today, and we're making money. For the first six months of, of this year, we made $5 billion. That's a $7.5 billion turnaround versus the same time period last year. So we have a good foundation, but mostly what we're doing is we're working with stakeholders and we're managing our business very effectively. And consumers are rewarding us for that behavior. For consumers, there was an article uh, a while ago in the Wall Street Journal, 70% of consumers said that they would shop a Ford product just by virtue of the fact that we didn't claim bankruptcy and we didn't need government assistance. So uh, we've done it the right way. We've managed 
through some very difficult decisions as a company. It's been through great hardship for our dealerships and our employees, but we're getting through that, and we're keeping our head above the water. Dave Mondragon, thanks very much for joining us.